Have you ever played house as a child? What did that house look like? Now take the most whimsical, unconventional house of your dreams and allow your adult imagination to sprinkle in a secret family curse and fill it with the most despondent realities of life. The mixture of both make for a strange tale, but in reality, well, let's flip through this oddity and take a peek. The harrowing tale of What Remains of Edith Finch centers around our main protagonist, Edith, as she guides us through the story of her strange upbringing and all the chaos, loss, and love that shaped her life story. You walk along this narrative as it unfolds, words materializing on the screen in front of you. A fork in the road, both paths leading onward to your family home, where generations of Finches lived and died mysteriously and tragic deaths. The house is fantastical and fairy-like, conjuring images of the crooked house, the old woman who lived in a shoe and her many inhabitants, as well as the grandeur of a castle in terms of height and whimsy. However, when you take a look inside and see that most of the doors have been sealed or locked, fashioned with a peephole to peer upon the long gone relatives, the memories and the monsters of their past preserved and untouched like a mausoleum, where the dead and the living coincide in perfect harmony. The story could end here and that would be a tragedy, encased in an even bigger tragedy, but the entire abode is riddled with passageways. The key that Dawn, Edith's mother, left her upon her passing, opens these up and Edith finally gets the opportunity to assemble the puzzle of her family tree. It is a 500 year old story, the narrator tells us, and that it is one of both fortune and misfortune. Beginning in Norway, the roots of the Finch family tree Odin and Ingeberg joyously welcome their second child and only boy, Johanna. That joy is short-lived and expelled. Johanna dies of unknown causes, the typical and perplexing way most of the Finches pass, and his death is followed in quick succession by his mother, Ingeberg, possibly from childbirth, but that detail is never revealed, but is more suggestion from the game's cult following. For a while, things are okay. Edie and Odin carry on with life as best they can, Edie grows and marries Fen, who takes on the Finch name. This really puzzled me, since it is common North American tradition to take the man's last name. However, in that time in Norway, depending on social economical status, it wasn't unheard of for a man to take his wife's family's last name. Keep in mind as well, the Finches are portrayed as stubborn family, so based on that information, it makes more sense. It is only when Edie gives birth to baby Molly in 1937 that Odin insists they break the family curse and sail to America, house and all. Tragedy befalls the family a third time and reveals that the curse has no borders. Odin dies only weeks after his granddaughter's birth, being swept away in 40 foot waves, plunged into the sea, house and all, just off the coast of Washington. The biggest remnants of hope remain Edie, Sven, and baby Molly find land safely and carry on the family name. They build a home and a family cemetery to give Odin a final resting place. This is where the game really begins and we start to learn more information about the Finches in no particular order, but for continuity sake, we will begin in the beginning and end at the end. As this is a story of a family curse, it goes without saying this is a series of short stories, to put it bluntly, recounting their deaths. Molly dies shortly after her 10th birthday in 1947. She is sent to bed without any supper and fills her hungry belly with various inedible poisonous objects. She hallucinates a fictitious story that kicks off well-meaning enough. The family cat jumps from her second story bedroom window chasing a bird to dine upon. But you evolve from there and as the hunger grows or perhaps the effects of the poison increase, the story becomes strange and creepier. You end as a monster aboard a passage boat, slithering along, eating the travelers, and lastly, the captain. We awaken Molly's room as this new monster, and she is writing in her journal. She senses the monster, which I believe personifies the family curse. The Finch lineage is not lost just yet. Edie and Sven have four other children, Barbara in 1944, twin boys Sam and Calvin in 1950, and the youngest, Walter, in 1952. Barbara's story was my most favorite of all. Giving a nod to the Creepshow comic books and licensed to use the classic music from Halloween, her end is left for the readers to decide. 
a former child star with an iconic spine-chilling scream, Barbara starts to lose her ability as she grows and is all but washed up. On her 16th birthday, however, she is set to be honored at the Beastie Cons, and she jumps at the chance to revive her dying career. The storyline twists back and forth, like all good Creepshow comics do, an ending you'd never expect. Barbara cannot attend the festival, forced to babysit her younger brother Walter when her father cuts his hand on a saw. Her boyfriend attempts to scare her to resurrect her scream, and a murderer is on the loose. It's all very when a stranger calls. Barbara finally finds her scream when the whole murder setup is a hoax to surprise her by the BeastieCon cosplayers, who are not cosplaying at all, but are actual beasts, attacking her and presumably killing her while her brother, thought to be lost, is cowering under his bed. The other stories I will just give a brief summary. Calvin dies while trying to make a complete loop on his swing, only to fly from it and over a cliff into the same savage ocean that took his grandfather Odin. He is only 11. Sam dies at the age of 33 when he takes Don, Edith's mother, on a hunting trip and while taking a picture with the prized buck Don kills, the buck not so dead after all, sends Sam hurling off a cliff to his untimely death. Walter lives to be the oldest of Edie and Sven's children. He dies at the age of 52. After sequestering himself for 30 long years in a bunker under the family home, Walter always hears a monster rumbling in the background. He finally finds the determination to leave. He takes a sledgehammer, smashes through the brick wall, and follows tracks to lead him out. He is hit by a train, which turns out to be the rumbles of his make-believe monster. Sven dies at the age of 49, being crushed by a dragon slide he built for his son Walter's 12th birthday, which Edie references to Edith about in the story when asked how her great-grandfather dies, that he was killed by a dragon. Sam is the only finch to have children from the five. Don, in 1968, Gus in 69, and Gregory, and the most heartbreaking of all the deaths in my opinion and what was the cause of Sam's divorce from his first wife, Kay, in 1976. Let's talk a little more in depth about Gregory's death, although it is not the longest story. Little Gregory is in the bath playing with his toys as his mother talking passionately and furiously on the phone with her husband Sam in the background. She apologizes to Gregory about forgetting about him and drains the tub of water. The whole scene is lighthearted and playful until the end. It plays out like Fantasia, and in a morbid twist, the frog he is playing with turns on the faucet and fills the tub with water as Kay gets another phone call from Sam. Gregory drowns at just the tender age of one. Gus dies at the wedding of his father Sam and his new wife who is not named in the game. He ironically says he'd be dead before he sees a wedding in their yard and instead can be seen flying a kite. An enormous wind picks up and he is crushed by the wedding reception tent. Don dies much later from a terminal illness somewhere around the age of 47-48, as the exact date in 2016 is not specified, but not before she marries a man who yet again carries on the Finch family name. I'm starting to think someone should have been smart enough to cease the family name as a viable end to the family curse, but sometimes heritage and having successors is more important than the successors themselves. Dawn, like her father, has three children, Lewis in 88, Milton in 89, and our narrator Edith and the namesake of great-grandmother Edie in 1999. Lewis perishes while on his job at the cannery. It is strongly suggested that he dies via decapitation at his own hands by a mechanism that beheaded the salmon in the cannery. While drugs and alcohol are said to play a factor in his declining state, he is also constantly escaping into this alternate reality and melding into the characters of his fantasy world. His story was a little drawn out for my tastes. And though the layout of the story and playing a dual storyline added some appeal, it could have been much shorter and did his biography more justice. Oddly enough, Milton, we never get concrete evidence he even dies. He disappears when he is 11 and is not given a headstone, but a memorial in the family cemetery. He is also the main character from Giant Sparrow's game Unfinished Swan, which precedes what remains of Edith Finch. It is suggested he may open up the door at the end of the flip book Edith picks up in his room and steps into the game as the king. Milton's missing posters can also be seen scattered here and there throughout the entire grounds. 
That leaves us with Edie and Edith as well it began with them so it should end. Edie dies in the home after Don and Edith leave swiftly and urgently towards the end of the game. Not willing to lose another one of her children to the great curse, Don leaves all her belongings after getting mad at Edie and says she will have the nursing home sent for Edie in the morning. Edie was the oldest living Finch at the ripe age of 93. It is suspected, but never confirmed in the game, that she dies of mixing her medication with alcohol, possibly intentionally. And last, for Edith. I should mention that all the while telling this story, one of the first things I noticed about Edith's character while walking the path to her now inherited Finch family estate is that if you look down, Edith is with child at the young age of 17. I'm not sure if she has a sense she will die or if she is fearful of the family curse, but she is summarizing all the lives of the Finches in her journal to pass along to her unborn child. She dies a year after her mother's passing during childbirth and gives birth to a son, Christopher, who can be seen placing flowers on her grave in the end scene. Hey guys, thanks so much for sticking through that. I really hope you enjoyed and appreciated my review of what remains of Edith Finch. Um, it is my least favorite pick of the March games, which is not to say I didn't enjoy it. It is still a good game in its own right. It probably wouldn't be a game I would replay again um, because I don't feel like there's a whole lot of replay value in it. You can go back and try to find some of the Easter eggs or secrets that you missed in the first playthrough of the game. My pros and cons are as follows. The pro was it was really beautifully created. The storyline was great. It was believable enough. The characters, characters were fantastic. Um, it gave enough backstory. It was really beautifully crafted. I, I really enjoyed the graphics of the game. And it was, like I said, just long enough so that you didn't get bored, but not so long that you felt overwhelmed by story that didn't really matter. Um, there was one storyline that I wasn't really a f fan of, and it's just that it carried out too long. I thought it could have ended before that, but I discussed that in the game. The cons, it's just the replay value for me, mostly. Although it is a great story, it was it was a bit of a slower game. Um, it's, you know what? Every game's not going to be for everyone. Uh, in the end, would I... If I didn't know anything about this game, knowing what I know now, would I play it? I think I would play it, um, but put myself in the mind frame that I'm playing through a story, which is fantastic. Um, that you're you're kind of playing a movie in introspect. So I really, you know, I would play it again. It wouldn't be on my top favorites. We have a digital copy. Um, right now the game is really, really overpriced uh, because it is a limited run game. It's hard to get for under $150 Canadian. So that being said, I will not be picking up a physical copy anytime soon. If it comes down in price, maybe. But like I said, for me, there's not a whole lot of replay value. But anyways, it did round off the March picks and I really appreciate that Denver Gamer picked it. It, it's different. It's something I've never played before and I do appreciate that. So if you like this review, please give it a thumbs up. Please like, subscribe, comment, ring the notification bell, and please watch my other reviews of um, Detroit Become Human and also Little Nightmares. And until I see you next time, game on.